Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Bristol Festival of Ideas and this event on the future of cities. We're delighted that this is in association with a number of partners. Uh, it's one of our Observer events. The Observer is the media partner of the festival. And we're very grateful for the support of the Observer for all the work they do with us. And it's also in association with the Academy of Urbanism, which is having its annual congress in the city uh, this weekend. And the Future Cities Catapult, who we work with on a range of um, talks and events, and we'll be doing so more next year, when we have a year-long programme called the Festival of the Future City. So this is really the beginning uh, of that journey, and we've got an excellent panel uh, to start us off on our way. As chair, we have Rowan Moore from The Observer. He's architecture critic of The Observer, formerly director of the Architecture Foundation, architecture critic of The Evening Standard, and editor of Blueprint magazine, and the author of Why We Build. Um, his writing has been published in several countries. He's a curator of exhibitions, lecturer, taken part in conferences and debates, and chaired and participated in many juries for design awards and competitions. And in 2014, this year, he was named Critic of the Year in the UK Press Awards, the first architectural writer to receive this award. With him, Professor Wolf Dasseging, Head of Urban Planning in Freiburg between 1984 and 2012. Um, his work included many different areas, central station area, roads, district marketplaces, concepts, development plans, projects for the social city and public spaces. And he's currently professor at the University of Freiburg in the Faculty of Philosophy, Institute of Sociology, and associate professor in the Academy of Administration and Economy in Freiburg. Jamie Lerner, an architect and urban planner, founder of the Instituto Jamie Lerner and chairman of Jamie Lerner Associates. Um, he was three times mayor of Curitara in Brazil, Curitaba in Brazil, led the urban revolution that made the city renowned for urban planning, public transportation, environmental social programs and urban projects. And Saskia Sassen is the Robert S. Lynn Professor of Sociology and co-chair of the Committee on Global Thought, Columbia University. Recent books include Territory, Authority Rights from Medieval to Global Assemblages, A Sociology of Globalization, and a new edition of Cities in a World Economy. Her new book, Expulsions, Brutality, and Complexity in the Global Economy, has just been published, and we're delighted to have early copies of that here. She was chosen as one of the top 10 Top 100 Global Thinkers by Foreign Policy in 2011 and Top 100 Thought Leaders by GDI, MIT, 2012 and 2013. So I think you agree it's a fantastic panel. Would you welcome that panel to the stage? Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, and for a fantastic introduction for all of us, which means I don't have to do it. Hmm? Um, the pouring of the tea. <laughs> um, our three speakers are going to give a, 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 a short talk each um, on the theme. And uh, I'm going to then engage them in conversation. And then I'll, I'll welcome you to join in the conversation um, uh, in good time for, for contributions from everyone. So think about your, your killer questions. Um, and without more ado, I'll ask uh, Jamie to, uh, to start off. Okay. I'll try to make it very briefly. Uh, I realize last years that there's a few cities that they're really making important changes. I'm happy to be here in Bristol where you have uh, a lot of uh, new transformations. And what is, why it's happening? It's increasing of bureaucracy increasing of distrust and there's a lack of leadership because every time when you want to make it a change you have to have a political will uh, uh, you have to have a strategy you have to have a kind of 
equation of co-responsibility. What is happening now, it's we're making more and more the city more complex. Uh, I've been, Saskia knows, at many, many meetings everywhere. For 30 years, 20 years in Sao Paulo, the same meetings. <laughs> And the same, and nothing happens. <laughs> so, and it could happen. Yes, it's possible. Because besides the normal priorities, which is education, health care, the care of children, uh, safety, there are three issues that they are becoming very important, not only for your city, but for the whole mankind. One is mobility. The second is sustainability, which is linked to mobility too. And the third is coexistence, tolerance, social diversity. Okay, is this possible in the city? Yes. It's not a question of scale, because I've met many mayors that are saying, oh, our city is so big. It's not a question of scale. It's not a question of uh, financial resources. And, and it's not so complex. The city is not so complex that the complexity sellers want us to understand that. And the world is full of complexity sellers. We should beat them with slippers. <laughs> because, and there is one thing I realize, innovation is starting. If you want creativity, cut one zero from your budget. If you want sustainability, cut two zeros from your budget. But if you want solidarity, assume your identity and respect others' diversity. So, uh, I, and sometimes we want to have all the answers. This is so prepotent, having all the answers. I think starting is important. And when we realize how different can a good start can provide, and normally we're afraid to start because we want to have all the answers. And we have to understand that it's like a trajectory where you, when you start and leave some place to people to correct, to correct you when you are not on the right track. So it's a commitment with innovation, simplicity, and imperfection. Mm -hmm. If you want to make it happen, I, I love the saying of, of I read in a small park in Mexico City. Mejor la gracia de la imperfección do que la perfección sin gracia. <laughs> Better the grace of imperfection than the perfection without grace. So we have to assume our simplicity and imperfection and start. Probably what I'm saying is so naive, but I'm more happy being naive. <laughs> and because everything we're speaking has to do with dreams. And a city, every city has a dream, has to have a dream, or you can call this a scenario 
a project, an idea that everyone or the large majority, they'll understand it is desirable. So it's a desirable dream. So how to make people involved in a desirable dream, that's the key issue. And this desirable dream, I saw this in Bristol. And this is very important. That makes me happy in being here. Thank you. Well, Rowan, thanks a lot uh, to invite me to this place. Uh, it's, of course, a matter of fact that uh, worldwide, worldwide we have uh, total different uh, ways to find uh, resolutions for the cities. We are living here in Europe, and Europe is, uh, for my opinion, you, are, you can be happy. Huh? You can be happy if you compare it worldwide to other areas we have... Uh, enough water, we have enough to eat, we have uh, lodging, we have, uh, well, we have security, it's a very important point, we have health care. So when I see now, I'm, I'm now working at the university since uh, three years, and have a lot of time to travel and to see around. Europe is one of those areas where we could create ideas which we can transport to other areas. I came first time to Bristol, uh, I think in the 60s. I uh, worked as a window cleaner, I was a pupil at that, side, at that time, worked as a window cleaner in Derbyshire, and from the money I earned, I made a hitchhiking tour from Lens End to John Groats. Huh? <laughs> so a lot of things, it was fantastic. Huh? I will come back to this point because it's important when you talk about this area in Britain. Mm -hmm. In Europe happen now a lot of things. And you see also in Europe you will have winners and losers. Mm -hmm. In this way you can say one of the most important points is how to integrate the young people into our ideas. Has everyone asked the younger ones how they want to live, in which way they want to live, or are these the developers who tell them in this way you can live, and if you don't want to live in this way, well, I'm sorry, we cannot bring you to any unit or to any, any space or to any uh, development. No, you have winners and losers, and you must be careful here, and this, this machine is already going. It depends always on people. If you are on the side of winners or if you are on the side of losers. You find a lot of persons, I don't want to put it always on this political side. Uh, politi politicians must do this and that and they don't do that. That is because we cannot make it. No, it depends on person, on keen persons. On persons also <coughs> who are I say all the time, they can be mad or stupid. Mm -hmm. We need ideas which are totally different from those we have. Because when you compare it to the situation we are standing, and we are better off here in Europe than anywhere, or mostly or most part of the world, then you can say, where have the normal per persons brought us to? So you have now different, different uh, different cities in Europe, the one are on the winner side, the others on the loser side, and those who are on the winner side have seen that the young generation is that generation they have to take care of. I just may, may, may explain it in some, some, short, uh, some short sentences. Go to Scandinavia. There's a run from the outside to the inner areas, but not to all inner areas. There are some areas. 
in Finland it's Ulu and Tampere and of course Helsinki. In Sweden it's the area around Malmö. Malmö does a very, very good job. And Copenhagen, of course. It's uh, also Stockholm, which is very, very expensive and no one of the young person can afford it. It's in France, it's Bordeaux, it's Marseille. I don't want to count these, but there are areas, there are areas which are totally going down. The younger ones, who in former years, after they had made their education, went back to the places where they came from, they have now this machine of computer. They're going in the computer and check where can I get education? Where can I get a job on short ways? Where is the, the situation in this way that I have a cultural mixture? That I have, of course, also healthcare. That I have, for example, the possibility to get very close access to open public transportation system. So you have this all on a fingertip, very short. And now I come to Britain. In Britain you have, of course, when you go inside these machines, you have London, which is like a Hoover. It's a Hoover. When you talk in Europe, I, I, I'm German, but I feel as European. I'm, I'm not coming to this place to speak as a, as a German person. I never would do that. When you, when you see this, this area of this country, you see London. London as Hoover, big machine. And then you say, what happens to the rest? What is it? What happens to the area Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds? It was uh, an area which was uh, in the same situation than the Rhine Ruhr region in Germany, which has changed totally in between 20 mm -hmm. years. You come to Blackpool. I was in Blackpool in the 60s. It was a roaring time, rolling stones at that time. I had no money, but I could hear them. <laughs> <laughs> I came back to, to Blackpool in February. The weather was awful. I went with Peter Hall around this area, and I said, what happened here? Huh? You go to places, and you see those places are losers. Mm -hmm. But you all paid a lot of money, tax money, inside. The infrastructure is existing, and nothing happened. So you must ask, why does it happen? And you come in Britain very close to this point. You are too much centralized governed. <laughs> the main important point. If you, uh, we, can talk, we can talk about everything. Huh? If you are not going to this point, yet that you find a way to give more power to the cities, that they can say to the government in London, as we are saying in Germany to those in Berlin, not Berlin is saying to us what we have to do, then you will not win this race because Europe is going very fast. It's very fast going, losers and winners. Now we come to Bristol. It's a fabulous city. Not why I'm, I'm sitting here. It's a city which has a Terrible, uh, terrible good uh, um, uh, scenery around this river. Where it has a mixture of houses, good ones, worse ones. Uh, which has a university. Mm -hmm. You have young people. Uh, the discussion two years ago or three years ago or two and a half years ago, I don't know, to make a campus university to build outside more of the university is totally stupid. People, the younger ones have to come inside to make this mixture, to make this. Well, well, the elder ones always say, well, they are loud, they are shouting, they are make too much noise, and so on. Be proud that they make noise. Huh? Be proud. When we have gone, we are sitting in this box, or not sitting, laying in this box, two meters and 60 centimeters, and then you have no noise anymore. <laughs> 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 life, make, yeah. life makes noises. Huh? So I will come to this point. <clears throat> uh, cities are always the result of their political culture, <coughs> of their independent authorities, independent authorities, that's the main important point, independent, I say it again, independent authorities, and not those persons who look just after the next job, 
They are the result of their uh, institutions which are working inside. Mm -hmm. For example, one very important institution is the university. I only can say every second week should be a contact between the leaders of the university and the city. What can we manage in which way can we do it? And of course of the population. But the leadership, that's the most important point. Beside this centralization, and then I will stop. Mm -hmm. There's another point from my opinion, very important. We have in Germany a law that we can freeze the land price. On a certain amount, we can freeze it by law. That means a land, agricultural land, which is worth, I can say it in pounds or in euro, it doesn't matter, which is worth as agricultural land uh, 10 pounds. Mm -hmm. After they made the decision that you can build on an area, it can explode. But we can say, well, he must have, those persons who have it, must have, a, must have more money, of course. But not the, that much money that it goes on the speculative, spe speculous area. The, those who pay the most get the bets to get the land, and then they make the worst development. Huh? <coughs> so we can freeze this price, and only by freezing the price, you can resolve the, 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 social, the social problems in your country. Because when the land price is high, the developers, of course, must make a lot of money, and they do it, and then the social stabilization cannot take place. So we create it in this way. One third stabilize the price, one third of the area has to be built for rich people who have money, the other point has to be built for people, one third, who rent their houses, and one third for those who get social subsidizers. And this all in a mixture, not separation. Mixture. And this is the third point. The mixture in Britain is also a problem you have. And now we come back to Bristol, mm -hmm. last sentence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here you can bring a model, for my opinion. You have now a tough mayor. In Tampere, in Helsinki, they have a lady. She is a very tough mayor, young, 38. She, she, is, she says, no, I want to do something. Most of the people say, no, don't touch me. I want to get a douche, yeah? mm -hmm. but the water should not come to my skin. Yeah? Mm -hmm. so, in, so in this way, you have the possibility now to say, decentralize, give more power to the, to the mayors. Mm -hmm. The next point is, Think about the young population, that are those who are the, the, the young ones are your fortune. And stabilize this price that the developers or those that there is no speculation inside. And when I talk to, I, I can say it here, it's no, it's no uh, secret. Nick Bowles, the, the minister of uh, planning was in Freiburg last year in September. And I told him about this. And I told him, told him talk to him seven hours, seven hours, huh? like an elephant to an I talked and talked. And after seven hours, he was convinced because I told him, this is no socialism, this idea of stabilizing the, the ground price, the price of the land. This is giving future to the next generation for the younger ones who normally cannot afford any. And now I stop. Huh? Yeah, we'll, we'll hear more about this. Okay, more thank you. About this, but, uh, Yeah. Mm. Um, well, let me build on what has been said. I agree with the issues raised by both speakers. And let me sort of enter a couple of zones. One of them is the type of economy that dominates. There are multiple economies in any of other countries. But the dominant sector is marked by two features. And those features feed into processes that are destroying or creating the winners and loser cities. So um, the dominant sectors spatialize uh, the way their spatial organization is in very central spaces, the global cities that I have written about. And right now, London turns out to be an extreme case. It means that a lot of energy is sucked out. And this is happening 
all over the world. I mean, there might be some exceptions. China is right now building 100 cities. So it's a slightly different, but even there you see a lot of energy, economic energy, cultural energy is pulled out of these cities. So again, I will also say that what Bristol is doing with this festival is just great, and it's such a beautiful city, moreover. Um, now, so that, that produces, when I think about cities and the future, it produces a very dystopian view. If we don't break this system, it's going to be a very tough struggle, even if mayors get more power, because the, 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 the economic sectors that dominate pull towards the center and exhaust and sort of partly destroy other economic sectors. So I think, and I think that one of the major challenges we face is this emergence of what I think of as predatory formations. Predatory, actually predators tend to be often are very nice animals, you know, they are biologically designed, but when we use it in this sense, I mean it as a negative, huh? predatory formations. So what we're dealing with is not just very rich people and very powerful people, or very powerful firms. We are dealing with mixes that contain technological capabilities, electronic networks, yes elites, yes powerful people, bits of law, bits of accounting, that all have enabled capture at the top on a scale that we have not seen for quite a while. And we see this in diverse ways all across the world. I think this is a kind of, to use my language, a systematicity that is very, very troublesome. And it's not good for cities. Now, the, the, when I think about how we know what would make a difference, how can cities become actors. I was just at a conference on with, with all legal scholars, and one of the issues on the table was, can cities be legal actors? Because right now, they are not. There is law, there is urban law, etc., but they cannot function. Our national states in the international arena function as legal actors, lawful actors. With a and so I think, I think if cities Cities need to accumulate a whole variety of capacities and possibilities. Now, it seems to me that there are certain domains where cities can be major innovators and, and be so partly informally, outside the realm of the law. So one of them is the environmental question. I'm right now very interested in how discoveries made by biologists can actually be implemented in the space of the city in a way that they cannot at some sort of national level. When you look at the national regime on the environmental question, it is all about carbon trading. That is a joke. That just redistributes the right to pollute or the right to buy more rights to pollute. That is what national governments are doing. Mm -hmm. So in Rio, you know, when the, when the meeting happened, we had a summit of mayors, and mayors the, the, you know, from an incredibly diverse set of cities, they have learned how to talk with each other. That is quite extraordinary, I think. You know, that is really interesting. Why? Because they share practical issues. They've got to act. Then came the national governments, and they immediately regressed. I hope I'm not offending any national head of government here. They regressed to carbon trading, which is a kind of nationalism, you know, a negative nationalism, if you want. Now, just to give you two illustrations of what I'm talking about, because when you look at it that way, you immediately are dealing with a distributed space where the fact that London is capturing a lot of the economy does not obviate, does not n deny the fact that every city can do certain types of things that will mobilize people, that will generate a kind of economic activity. So just two examples that come from this biological application. And, and again, I want to emphasize, this is just one thing. I'm not saying that this is the solution. This illustrates what cities can do from the ground up and hence sort of recover a certain sphere of activity that includes economics, that includes politics in a way, even if London is capturing everything. And I'm just using London because we're here, but I can say that about other cities. I can say that about New York in the United States. Now, one of them is uh, um, a bacterium that if you put it in brown waters, brown organic waters, you know what we all produce in vast quantities in homes, restaurants, etc. 
it actually generates a molecule of plastic. Durable, resistant, but biodegradable. Now that does two things. One, it's also a massive problem. You understand, which is how do we get out of, we need plastic in everything we do. How do we get out of plastic that is not biodegradable, which is killing our oceans, which is, we all know the disasters that that is. But secondly, it transforms every city into the producer, either of the input or the final product, the input being brown waters to make that kind of plastic, and the other one is the final product, you make a plastic. So what is now a negative becomes a positive, that recoding, and that is a totally distributed space. There we are all producing it, the brown waters. There we can all act on it. So regardless of whether we can destroy this economic system that does capture at the top, we can do that. Second little example, another bacterium. Bacterium and algae are the queens huh, of this whole new world where biologists are dealing with the environmental question. And this is a bacterium that, that if you sort of, it, it works in concrete. As it lives its little life in concrete, it deposits a calcium. And that calcium begins to seal off the, the walls, if you want, it can be, the, it's being applied experimentally, but now it's entered the commercial phase, you know, on sidewalks, anything that is concrete. And eventually, but there is a kind of temporality, the biosphere has her own type of temporality. So eventually, it actually has the effect of purifying the air immediately around it. Now again, that is a recoding of something that is in all cities, that is now basically a negative, made into a positive. Now, in, among the experimental uh, 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 motions, whatever initiatives, are some that hit low income and modest income neighborhoods, and they give a minimum amount of money, they mobilize local firms, just to give you the micro instance here. And I think, moreover, it is the first step in a trajectory of mobilizing local residents into something, you know, into something that can move on. When you can get the local people to, what you were saying, to be participants in all of this. And what I'm talking about is a very distributed economic zone. Well, economic, biological, et cetera, it's a mixture of things. Now, I want two final, two final quick comments. So along the same lines of this, how do we mobilize every part of a city. I, one of the things that I've been sort of thinking about is something that I refer to very briefly as open sourcing the neighborhood. Every neighborhood has knowledge about the city that the codifiers at the center of the city, whether it's the planners, the central economists, the government, the experts, you know, those who have to sort of flatten the differences of the city, does not have. The grandmother, because she's lived there for a long time, she has time to observe, she can see the difference, the changes. The child, because she's close to the ground, etc. The homeless person, like I like to say in New York, Footnote, in New York we make two censuses, one of rats and one of people. We have more rats than people. So guess who's the ultimate expert on rats in all their very, the homeless person, in, probably in the neighborhood because in the center of the city, he or she would not be allowed. So I'm saying, can we bring all that local knowledge of the neighborhoods onto networks that enter the zone of the codified knowledge of the center. Again, a way of mobilizing every neighborhood. Now, final sort of on a, on a, grander, on a grander level, I think that besides the predatory formations that I talked about, a second major, major challenge is that our cities are losing indeterminacy. Now, I know that's a bit of an abstract term, but when we create a mega complex where before you had thick tissue with a lot of little streets, we are simplifying urban space, we are over-determining it, it's one function, we are eliminating public space. So this question of 
the way in which our cities are losing indeterminacy. So I think of the space of the street. It's a critical space. It's not the piazza with embedded codes, how you have to conduct yourself. No, the street is this messy space. And the same thing, you know, at, at a more abstract level, this question of indeterminacy. So when I think about the cities of the future, I think we've got to stop complaining about the bad things. And we've got to open up towards a whole variety of new initiatives that are going to entail collaborations with scientists, politicians, writers, experts on the city, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you very much. Um, I think we heard something very optimistic and something very pessimistic in the joint contribution of the three speakers. Um, the optimism is the idea that it is possible to, if you get the right people, to, to really make cities work much better. And the pessimism was coming from Saskia in particular, and, and by the way, it's also in her, her latest book, Expulsions. And also the optimism in what I said. There is, and we'll come to the optimism, <laughs> in your optimism in a minute. But that there are very, very powerful global forces that are actually greater than any individual, which are pushing things in a certain direction. Um, so I suppose the, the big question is, what can individual efforts really achieve? Um, Jamie said uh, that getting started was the big thing. So just to kind of ground the discussion in, in actual experience, um, it would be very good to hear from you and Wolf how you got started in Curitiba and, and Freiburg. Just very briefly, when you started your job of making over Curitiba, what was the situation? I started to be involved with the city <clears throat> when I was a student. At that time, the mayor of my city, he was destroying the whole history of the city, making more bigger streets for cars and, you know, that kind of uh, traffic engineers mm -hmm. they like. I'm nothing against traffic engineers. One of my best friends are traffic engineers. <laughs> <laughs> but they know how to kill a city. <laughs> Only they can know how to kill a city. But that, and the students and professors, we started the movement against that kind of, of. So I've got involved and after, when I'm graduated, um, in the Institute of Urban Planning and then, well, being a mayor. But I realized one thing. Uh, <clears throat> the demonstration effect is very important. It's not just starting. It's showing that you can make the difference. Mm. That if everyone, <laughs> we didn't try to make to start big, just small pieces, small yeah. effects, small demonstration effects. Okay, the whole system of public transport <clears throat> was a big issue in Curitiba, but we start with one line. But we did it as we, in a very good way. That means we started with 50,000 passengers a day, and now we're transporting 2 million and 700,000 passengers a day. And the subway in London is transporting 3 million. A much bigger city, much bigger. Mm -hmm. The oldest system of, of subway in the world. What means that? I remember the issue of garbage. Well, we didn't have where to put our garbage. Well, the whole problem, landfills and so. So we realized that we had to make it simpler. Separating garbage. So we teached every child in all the schools. It was not a test. 
Because when you're trying to make a test, nobody will pay attention. But the whole, every, ch every child, so in the child, during six months, in the children, they teach their parents. And then we have the highest, one of the highest rates of separation in the world. 70% of people who are separating in our homes, garbage. So another example, when I was a governor, we had the problem of pollution on our base. So we didn't have that money, for instance, in Rio, they had $800 million to clean their base. Uh, it was a loan from the World Bank. We didn't have that. So how we started? Just an agreement with the fishermen. If the fishermen catch the fish, it belongs to him. If he catches garbage, <laughs> we buy the garbage. Brilliant. If today is not good for fishing, he's going to fish garbage. <laughs> the more garbage he's fishing, the cleaner bay we can. The cleaner the bay is better, more fish you have. <laughs> so it's, I'm sure that every city in the world can make some win-win right. projects. I've met in many cities very clever projects. So, but the demonstration effect is very important. But if you're trying to make organized people with uh, big assemblies and blah, 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 and just nothing happens. You have to have a scenario, an idea. If you want to make a change, propose a scenario or an idea or a project that everyone or the large majority, they'll understand it is desirable. It's and I think for, from the experience we I had in as a mayor, as a governor, there's a lot of, as Saskia and as they said, there's a lot of things that the cities can show how to make it. We never expected from federal. I didn't spend time, I didn't lost my time dealing with federal bureaucrats because they don't have any commitment. So, and also working with people that they are committed to the ideas. So how you can work. I realized one thing. We had good professionals, but some good professionals, they were not committed to the ideas. Mm -hmm. So I organized a cemetery of elephants. <laughs> that means they what they are committed, okay, let's let's change the city. You're not committed, we need good professionals to zone, to very good professionals. But the Cemetery of Elephants, they're going to work <laughs> in large, large time projects. It's okay, they're doing their job, very good. But don't, don't lose your time with people that they don't want to help. Never lose your time because it's always excuses. Oh, it's not possible. Oh, it's... My, my father used to say, if I knew before what your mother knows after, I could be the wisest man in the world. <laughs> um, so briefly, tell me, what, what was the situation when you arrived and how did you when you took up your post at Friday. First of all, I agree totally to, to Jamie, uh, with Jamie. Uh, we should have met 30 years earlier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
It would be very powerful. The sentence, uh, this is not possible, uh, which you are hearing uh, everywhere and, and at any time, was not, for me, never possible. Huh? The sentence, just to say, the sentence, this is not possible, is not possible. Huh? Is not possible. Well, I totally agree, you must not reinvent the wheel and you don't have to say, uh, I only start when I have a program for the total. Start with small steps. Huh? Start with small steps to let them see. What happened in Freiburg? In Freiburg it was uh, influenced by some facts. Facts are necessary. Huh? It was uh, 72, Club of Rome, limits to growth. It was 73, oil crash, real oil crash, real oil crash. Uh, I don't know if uh, someone knows still the barrel of oil cost at that time before the oil crash was. How much barrel of oil? How many dollars? Do you know that? Three dollars. Three dollars. Huh? And it went up to 24 dollars. So the industry, the whole industry in Europe said, now it's finished. Huh? What well, the government decided? The government decided at that time there was no discussion about CO2 emissions. No discussion. It was found in the mid of the 80s from Swedish science person. The government decided in nearly all states in Europe, because they have no influence what a city can do or not do, they decided we are going in Germany, we are going to build new 17 new nuclear power stations. At that time, Nuclear, nuclear energy was, was, was famous. Huh? Remember, it was Brussels, 1958, the World Exhibition, you had the symbol, uh, symbol plutonium. Huh? It was, uh, the whole <coughs> Russian state was founded on, on atomic. Huh? Energy was the future. Huh? So they said 17 power points, power, points, uh, power plants, uh, power, power machines, factories. Power stations. Station. Station. At that time, there came now several points together when you ask me this way. At that time we had a minister in Baden-Württemberg, in the land Baden-Württemberg, who had not such a, he was uh, conservative. He was the minister of the land. He lived in Freiburg. And the young people didn't like him at all. Huh? Didn't like him at all. And it was known that he had not such a good position when the First World War ended. For, uh, Second World War ended. He had, a, had made some very severe faults. Mm -hmm. And this all came on the table. So when they decided to bring one of these power plants up to the direction to Freiburg, 30 kilometers to Freiburg, especially first the young ones in the university said, no, we won't have it. I I'm not really sure if they wanted to go against this power, this, this atomic power. I'm sure they wanted to do something against him. But the power plant was the, 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 the crashing point, huh? the crashing point. And then happened something very interesting. The people outside, the farmers, who normally didn't have any contact with the citizens, because the ones said they are in the city, they are high-nosed, huh? and we, in the city, they said they are farmers, they have dirt under their fingernails. These two groups came together. This was a pressure group. And then remember, it was in, uh, it went on in this place. A friend of mine was uh, Rolf Disch. He was one of the pioneers, a small group, five persons. There were five persons who made it, five persons. And they were laughed because the price sank then down around 12, 30, 14 dollars. And afterwards, it was in this way that these group who said, we must go away from these fossil fuels, they will be laughed because the price went then on a, on, a, on a level which could, could go on. And they said, no, it will go up again. The Big Bang came in 1986, in 1986, when Chernobyl blew off. Then everyone was convinced this cannot go on in this way. And then happened something, also something, which, well, some points must happen. Normally people do not move because most of the people are totally lazy. They only do something when they feel it in the pocket. Then they do something. Huh? In Freiburg it was in this way, in 1982 came a new mayor. He was a socialist mayor, very big person. He went there for 20 years, was elected 20 years. Eight times, eight times and a half eight times, 20 years. So he was a very powerful man and he was totally against the green movement. But green not, not in this way you, you, you said. No, he, was, he said, these greens, these greens 
are young people who normally should elect the socialist. Mm -hmm. They are in this way green because they come from families which are, have money and they are now in this situation, they can share everything. And he said what they want in the parliament. They were at that time when I entered in 30, 80, in, in, in 83, were only th three, three, four, four persons were in the parliament from the Green Party. And the mayor said what they ask when they try to bring up a uh, discussion about we want to reduce our traffic in the city from about 50 kilometers to 40 kilometers, he said, well, you are totally wrong. We do it 30 kilometers. I do it better than you. We don't need you. And so it happened. So in this way it happened. And now you ask me, <clears throat> in which way can you do something? You can do it very quickly. Mm -hmm. The main point is you must see that the government, central government, can do nothing. Mm -hmm. Everyone has to bring his dust away from his own door. So the cities are these areas who can create something. The first thing is reduce the car circulation extremely. When the Pope was in Freiburg three years ago, they, the security closed for all movements, car movements, the city for three days. All would say now a catastrophe takes place. Nothing happened. <laughs> nothing happened. It went like that. Nothing, ha nothing happened. Huh? Yeah. And when these planners of traffic say, well, we must go inside and then outside. And I heard you, there were, were ideas uh, years ago to, to fill, the, uh, fill the area of this river, huh? to build a street through. Mm -hmm. You never build a, a street or a vein through the heart. Huh? You always circle around. You must first of all see which traffic who comes into the street has nothing to do. It's mm -hmm. only circling, circling through, through uh, um, 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 traffic. The next point is, I can only say George Ferguson, he has a staff. He has an area where, the, where the, uh, his staff is parking. For all those persons who are working in the authorities, from one table to the next one, they can come and park there, but it costs 100 pounds a week. <laughs> For all those per persons who are, who are in schools, hmm. 100 pounds a week. We made it, not 100 pounds, but we made it a little bit lower. 100 pounds is, of course, a, bit, a little bit high. But you saw from one day to the next one, 89% was reduced. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was working. So it, you must not say, what can he do? You must say, what can I do? In which way can I go? Mm -hmm. The traffic, you can reduce extremely here. Your city is killed, is killed mm -hmm. from traffic, is one point. The next point you can also do, it's, it's, very, it's, it's very easy to, to handle. Build up the lanes where the, where the buses are going, the private car circulation must stand, mm -hmm. And the buses must go, and also the, uh, the bicyclists must go. It's also good for healthcare, yeah? not sitting in the cha mm. chair and eat some chips and then say, he must run, not me. Yeah? <laughs> no, it's a good for healthcare. So, so you, it's a lot of, then you can, for, for example, for, you ask me, mm. schools to reduce energy. Go in and look the old machines inside, the old heating machines. You must find a way that the new invest for making a new machine inside can be paid by reducing the price of the energy. If you reduce this by 85% and you pay before 1 million per year, mm -hmm. you reduce this by 850,000 pounds or euro or something mm -hmm. like that. And you must, must bring a clever... Planning is not always, in, not anymore drawing a nice plan. No, mm -hmm. planning is more. Mm -hmm. It is more. It is more. It means you must have also the idea in which way you can calculate it. And then you must find banks, not mm -hmm. those you have in Britain who want to have the most money. Yeah? The more I have, yeah. uh, you, you cannot eat money afterwards. <laughs> huh? But the more I have, the more I want more. This is not the point. Mm -hmm. You must, we have certain sort of banks who give for those elements, for those ideas, 
very reduced percentage. Mm. We have to pay very reduced percentage for it. And so in this way, you can bring it up. One point you can make very easily. A plot inside the city, go in 60, 80 units for cooperating housing. Cooperating housing means no developer, no developer, all developers outside. You save around 30 to 30 percent of the of the of the uh, costs because the developer wants wants to earn and he does mm -hmm. not earn only the he, he takes the market price. Mm -hmm. huh? and the more you are on the sea, the more money in name mm -hmm. he takes. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Can I bring Saskia yeah. in on this because I think <laughs> this goes to the yeah. core of he what was, first he asked and then the yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, so I mean, so yeah. this is by the way. Um, we would welcome the view from Bristol on all of this in, in a few minutes, so have your questions ready. Um, but I think, um, you know, Wolf started talking about you know, a nice kind of bank. Yeah. But, <laughs> but what your book says is that there, right. that there are an awful lot of not so yeah. nice banks that yeah. seem to be kind of becoming more and yeah. more powerful. And, and, and also you talk about cutting the developers out of the process. But you are not bound to banks in England. Uh, no, you can but, go to um, other banks. Huh? But do you, do you think... I mean, also, sort of supplementary I, I to this, I, I would say, I mean, I've been hearing about uh, Curitiba for, for 20, 30 years. You know, I've been hearing about Freiburg for a very long time. And you've been hearing about finance and for 30 years. Yes, but I also, I'm wondering where the other Freiburg, yeah. you know, why aren't there more Freiburgs in Curitiba? There are some, right. but... Um, so, so do you see what you're talking about really, really happening, given that there are these kind of immense pressures, because you can't just say, I'm going to this bank and not that one, because the, the, right. the big bank will have something to say about that. Well, I mean, you ask about three little questions mm. right now, so let me just okay. very quickly your, run through. Right, one, right. Yeah. But, but um, on, on banks, we all need debt. If we want to buy a bicycle, because we want to protect the environment, whatever. The, the issue is that, I mean, what we need to differentiate is between the traditional bank, which sells money it has, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, at a reasonable, and if it's a little bank, chances are that whatever the interest payments the locals add, it recirculates in the town. So you have sort of a multiplier effect, right? But then you have finance, and finance is radically different from traditional banking, including from big traditional banks, because finance sells something it does not have. And in selling what it does not have, lies its creativity and its danger. Its creativity because it has to invent extraordinary instruments to invade sector after sector. Food that gets commodified, the commodities get financialized. Mortgages are not just mortgages, mortgages get financialized, mixed up with high-grade debt, and then they can play in the high investment sector to the risk of those small mortgage owners. So what we have today is, uh, just to give an example, it, there's a parallel history for, uh, for, the, for, for the UK. In the United States, we have managed to kill 15,000 small banks in the last 12 years. That is not good. Today, we have 70% of consumer banking, which is nonsense banking. Most of small firm banking, which is also very simple, could be traditional banking, in the hands of high finance. That is a major risk. So just to give you two examples that are not sufficiently familiar, how to destroy a city you know, or a neighborhood, not a city, a neighborhood. So in the United States, in the period of six years, high finance, I won't tell the full story, invents an instrument that allows it to satisfy the capital owners, which have far more capital than they know what to do with. And the capital owners, in the 2000s, begin to ask the intermediaries, the financial system, give me an instrument that has something material in it. By then, the value of finance, in terms of outstanding derivatives, was 15 times the value of global GDP. That money mm -hmm. did not exist. Mm -hmm. You see? So that is a risk. So what does finance? It goes and brings in whatever is left in the housing market has the back room of Goldman Sachs has a hundred physicists. Back room is where the secretaries used to sit. Now it has a hundred physicists sitting in there. And they develop complex instruments 
that delink whatever the little neighborhood house value, et cetera, from the high finance circuit. So what in five years, six years, according to the Central Bank of the United States, uh, 10 million households were thrown out of their homes. In Germany, invisible history, in 2007, almost 100,000 were thrown out. Same instrument. That instrument can go anywhere. In 2008, 89,000. I have all these tables. I have the 27 countries of the United States. Germany is among the high ones. Did you know that? Maybe no, you no, do. No, no. Very good. Well, great. Spain, in the last few years, 450,000. Hungary, a million people thrown out, households thrown out of their homes. A household can have one, two, three people. These are invisible histories that destroy not London, but the smaller sort of cities and the neighborhoods. So when it comes to finance, we need traditional banks. We should not demonize the little local bank. On the contrary, we've got to go back to small banks, city banks, little it's banks. Easy. City banks is the wrong term to use here. You know, I know, I know, I know. And, uh, and to credit unions. And those were actively destroyed when we neoliberalized. It took a very little intervention on the part of our national states, deregulate interest rates. That did it, <laughs> because those little banks depend. So these are all mechanisms through which our existing, when I talk about predatory formations, high finance is a predatory formation. The traditional bank is not. And anyhow, but the other thing you asked, can we do what well, I do? Do you see it happening that, that cities can fight against that, that they can? I, I think there is not enough knowledge about that difference that I mentioned. So that, that people, I mean, we try to mobilize people, leave the big bank, go to a small local bank, but there are not many small, small local banks left in the United States, you right? No, they have but their many, own money here in Bristol. That's good. <laughs> Bristol seems to be a very good city. But anyhow, but on the second one, um, I, I think the, the main point I was trying to make at the beginning is that we've got to not be neurotic about the power that resides in the center, about the power, because that is a self-destructive mode. What can we do? I agree completely with what these two former mayors, I gather, I don't know, have, have done, which is what can we work with where we are? And there is a lot of work to be done. Moreover, it's interesting stuff. We can mix scientific knowledge, technical advances. This is not, you know, that you downgrade the effort. No, it's the opposite. It's really working in vanguards of how we deploy scientific knowledge, how we deploy advanced technologies to actually grow neighborhoods, to grow every part of the city, our economies, our political economies, our sort of whatever, you know, citizen space should be a distributed space. Even if we have massive concentration, because that, I don't see that getting eliminated very soon. So let's forget about that and let's focus on what can happen right here. And I think we got some extraordinary examples mm -hmm. from... Um, yeah. Okay. Um, would anyone like to ask a question? All of you, I think, in a way, have referred a little bit to the importance of local leadership. That's the phrase I would use. And I think Freiburg and Curitiba are actually wonderful examples of bold civic leadership taking on these forces that Saskia has outlined. So my question is about um, leadership and whether members of the panel might say a little bit of uh, advice about what skills do city leaders need now to make a difference in this challenging world that we're all now in? Um, could I ask the non yeah, I, I, I think, well, I loved your cemetery of the elephants or whatever it was. <laughs> I think the, the smart leadership in cities is one that understands that the city is one of these very particular spaces where multiple forms of knowledge can be deployed to the advantage of the city as opposed to the advantage you know, of some corporate sector. So connect with the few biologists in a university who are interested in the environment. Most biologists are not. Connect with those technologists who want to open source the neighborhood. You know, that kind of stuff. And I think that, I mean, there is much more to be said, but from where I look at stuff, uh, I think that is very important. So the new mayor of, of New York wants to, you know, I'm going to meet with him to lay out, you know, what are, what is the full spectrum of modes of collaboration? So it, I think we are in a new epoch. It's not just the old model, in my perspective. Leadership has to deal with trust. You can have uh, staff 
where you're trying to you're trying to get them on mistakes. And the other way is give them trust and give them the possibility to have a good, important task. And, and at the moment when they can do it, uh, the result is incredible. So I always try to work with people that they wanted to make the difference. And sure, not naive, optimists, not naive. And I used to work, I liked to work with people that they could condense their thoughts, like poets, <coughs> artists. I'm not saying they're poets, but poets, artists, because they have a special skin. They can feel society earlier. If I can work with people that they can feel society earlier, why I should work with people that can feel society after? <laughs> so, and you can always have in every part in the world those kind of people that they have to courage to start. And because sometimes let's say insecure. They have good ideas, but they are insecure. Because they start to think, oh, this is a, such a good idea, probably it couldn't be mine. <laughs> and there's one thing I've noticed. Uh, never be afraid of a simple solution. Because there are so much, uh, there's so much smart people that they used to think, if it's too simple, why I shouldn't talk before? <laughs> so don't be afraid. Work with people that they are not afraid of simplicity. Because simplicity is focusing. It's always, I, I would say, uh, I could, I could have a good eye uh, if I, I never try to make tests with people. I could, I could understand in their eyes if they want to do it. I'm not a specialist, I'm not an ophthalmologist. Mm -hmm. But I can say, <laughs> you know the eye of the hope. Keep an eye on the hope. Well, <clears throat> those persons who lead a city, and the expression leadership is very important. These are no bosses of cities, it's leadership. I showed yesterday in my, my lesson, I gave this difference between leadership and boss. It's the first point. Leadership means you are head and have a group around you. And if someone of the group has better ideas than you, then you take it. The boss says, I'm the boss, and your ideas is uh, uh, nothing worse. I do it in my way. This has gone. When you look back, oh no, not, not back. When, when you see, for, for my opinion, you must have persons which are able to build up a vision for a city. And you remember, it was one of your statesmen here in Britain, Thomas Morris. He wrote Utopia, and uh, therefore we, he was hanged. I hanged him. We had a chancellor, a former chancellor, Helmut Schmidt, who said those who have visions should go to hospital. 
those persons are out, the new ones. So you must have someone who is very open-minded and who can convince. And he, uh, if he cannot do it, he must form a group around himself who can convince. And then it is in this fact the normal way of bringing it during the time the town hall runs. In the normal work, you cannot do those works as Jamie did and as we did. It's not a, only a full-time job. It's a job which goes also during night time. It goes on Saturday and Sundays. And it is like a priest in the church. You must convince. And if they throw you out through this door, you must come back through that door. Your skin must be so thick when they take the backbone out, you must stand upright. And you must not have these, these uh, mafioso, mafiosi, Friendships. Huh? Yeah. You just, well, I do not like those persons who jump like kangaroos around. Huh? There's one point which is necessary to say. The politician, politician um, waves, waves are totally different from the waves of planning. The planning waves are going like a sinus curve or something like that, but the sinus curve. Huh? The politician waves are going like a, what, how do you call it when a volcano is erupting, like a vulcan, vulcan, an okay, eruption, yeah? yes. a, a eruption, like an eruption. And where mm -hmm. those, both, both waves are crossing, mostly there is a conflict, a big one. And you must have a person who is going in this conflict this way, straight on, and not change his, well, he says, I'm now in a position. I earn so much money, when I cannot look in the mirror, I'm able to buy a new one. No, these are not the right persons. Huh? You must have persons who are very tough, who have a, an aim, an aim where to go to. And this aim, I think, could be found for mm. every city. Because this reduction of CO2 means which all countries have signed mm -hmm. in 97, Kyoto Protocol. The, also the Americans, and they took their signature away in 2001 when they felt something is going wrong. Huh? You can, under this idea, you, you can, not only can, you must build up a vision. What does it mean, reduce CO2 emission? It's not because I'm, I want to, to have something, want to be a hero. No, it is to give future for the next generation. That is the point. What is future for the next generation under these future for the next generation or generations, you can build up a vision for the city. And then you can follow this vision. And uh, a good mayor will follow that and will not jump like a kangaroo. I'm going to try and conflate a few questions into one. Um, so you talked, uh, there's quite a lot of talk about um, local initiatives and um, Europe specifically. And then I'm thinking on a disciplinary level, um, sort of scientific approaches and sort of economic approaches. But as a student of history of art, I was wondering whether there is scope for more arts-based alternatives to, um, to solving the problems of cities and perhaps more global uh, perspectives. So perhaps looking further afield, at perhaps more obscure areas for solutions. Yeah, that's, I think you raise a very important point. As you know, a city like Detroit got a bit of oxygen of real life when a lot of the Germans from Berlin who were being displaced by the gentrification of Berlin went there. Now, these are not very visible events, but they really matter. And as I mentioned before, I see these as trajectories. They're starting points for something. Number two, I think that the zone of culture, which includes art and includes, you know, it's more than art, culture is a broader example, is a, is a great way of mobilizing people. I, I mean, one of the challenges that I see in any city is how do we get people engaged, you know, in whatever it is. And so I know a whole bunch of artists who use very advanced, they're often engineers, also trained as engineers, who play with technology. And so like one made a little dog, a technical dog, that smells when there is in any space, and it could be here, it could be in a museum, etc. that there is some bad 
something bad. I don't mean bad air. I mean something that should not be there, something that is toxic. Well, kids learn from that, adults learn, you know. And then the, the, the other thing is the environmental question. I, th I know a lot of artists around the world who are using their art to explain something, to make something visible, to engage, to draw. So for me, culture, like the environment, you know, I mentioned that as a major zone, is a multi-sided, it is happening everywhere. And it is a great way of bringing different people together and a great way of creating distributed. It can happen anywhere, you know, in a city. So I'm all for that. I don't know that this helped understand, <laughs> but anyhow, yeah. Maybe it's a naive question, but in Britain we define cities by uh, whether there's a cathedral in them, which ropes in quite a few small towns. Um, Bristol's got 450, half a million people. I was just wondering if there is a threshold beyond which the population needs to cross to become complex enough to be defined in your terms as a city, and whether there's an upper level that would, would actually work against some of the devolution of power that you suggest is, is, well, I think we probably agree, uh, is necessary. What's the population of Freiburg? We have uh, 230,000 and uh, the city grows every year by around 1,000 people and we do only inner development, nothing to the outside, only development, mm -hmm. inner development. But that means density. The more you go out, the more you need infrastructure, the more the running costs will come up, and the next generation has to pay for it. And what, what's the population of Curitiba? It's two million, the city itself, and three and a half million, the metropolitan region. Hmm. But I think it's nothing related to the size of a city. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you can have a city from eight million people, and they have good quality of life, and sometimes you have a city of 100,000 people in a terrible condition. It's, it's the way, it's not the scale. And I'm taking profit, to, it's another issue because I forgot. There's a very tricky way how to deal with uh, uh, environment. Let's say, we're trying to, every government, we're trying to reduce 30% of our carbon emissions. But how? It's very easy to say, or mayor, or we're going to reduce carbon emissions. <laughs> this is a tricky way. It's uh, what is the way how, how you're doing that? Less cars, okay. Use less a car, separate your garbage, live closer to home, live closer to work or bring work closer to home. That could, because the city can play a very important mm -hmm. role to reduce carbon emissions, because 75% of carbon emissions are related to the cities. The half of the problem is the car. No, there is much more. Buildings. I mean, those okay. measures are all good. But you know what? We need much more than that. We need to it's enter okay. another I zone. I accept. We have... Yeah, <laughs> I, I accept that. It's not all. It's, it's, a, it's a good point. Because nearly 90% of all elements which are already existing, there is no idea how to manage it. Yeah. And I, I showed yesterday a situation from building from the 70s which we changed from the 70s, a 19-story house, 19-unit story house, which we changed from an area of the 70s into a passive house. And I showed also in which way you can calculate it. There are always possibilities to do something. And I agree totally with Jamie. It not, does not depend. You cannot say 750,000 is the limit or something like that. It depends in which way you are going to make these these this going together of a, sim a city, in which way the green comes in, where you make more density. Are you creating a city of the suburbs, or are you just saying, no, only the inner area? Are you creating a city of the suburbs where those persons who live outside have very close access to daily requirements and so on? Are you going and, uh, on to, to take the expression of elephants? 
are you going on to build these big shopping malls outside the center? Uh, this is the stupidest thing you, you, all, you all could say, and then you complain afterwards that you cannot buy your rolls or your, your daily requires by walking in the walking distance. So it comes all together. It's a, it's a coming together. And therefore, you need people who are creating it day by day, week yes. by week, month by month, to bring density to the lines of open public transportation system. And when you do that over more than five years, more than 10 years, when you make it like him or perhaps, then you can come to a very good res uh, uh, result. And to say about the art, just mm -hmm. one sentence yeah. about mm -hmm. the art. Yeah. In this way, when you reduce the traffic, you get a lot of space back. And this space is the place where art can take place. Art is also, well, just a theater, just managing places going around. It must not only be the situation like uh, the walking cloud in Chicago, this terrible good, uh, I don't know if you know that, this walking cloud from Kapoor is a British, uh, a British artist who made an excellent work there. The, the, point is, the point is, all those houses which were built, for example, from the authorities, mm -hmm. the, price, the price for the house, 2%, only 2% of the price cost of the house which the authorities, which the open public, uh, um, open public um, uh, persons are, are building, you have to put in the box and these two percentage can bring a lot of arts inside the city, but don't decorate it inside. Good buildings can also be a very good art. If you have the river here, it's fantastic. If you see these old, I say, krane, krane, what, what is it? Cranes, cranes. It's fantastic. You can, there you don't need arts. You just have to manage it in another way. And it's, you have so many chances here in, in, in Bristol. I, well, second life. We need a second life. Huh? Oh. Okay. Huh? Um, have you got a microphone? I'm, I'm from uh, India. I teach urban planning there. What we have, I mean, in terms of cities' challenges, is we have very weak governance at the local level. But we also have this very neoliberalized dreams of making every city a Shanghai, whether it's one million or five million. And we are making, so it's, it's not a Western import of visions per se, but it's more like we are making the same mistakes which probably European cities made in 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you convince the local leadership about not going about it all over again? Yeah. I'll leave and the leadership question to the two uh, mayors, but but you know and, and this is the mm. problem that we have an economic domin a dominant economic logic that spatializes in certain ways. Yeah. They are highly destructive of local economies, of local space, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, India, with all your private gated, is another disaster. I mean, mm -hmm. it is very, very bad. Then the Chinese are doing it a little better than you are, but just a little better. Mm. Huh? But I think that that um, I think we must we must take each city has to take itself a bit in hand and not fall for these major global operators where it's real estate development. The Financial Times of all newspapers, some of you must have seen it, did an analysis of how much of London we're talking London is owned by foreign. And I say, I say, you know what we're dealing with here is not the buying of buildings, houses, or not. We're, we're looking at land, urban land grabs. You know how we use this land grabs yeah. language for the global south, 200 million hectares bought in the last five years? Well, we're doing that with cities, city after city, this super prime market. So this is a very bad time. Now, on the thresholds, and partly to your question, I think you can handle a large population. Jamie said it. If you have a multinodal, London is pretty good in that sense, right? a multinodal so that you have multiple centers distributed rather than everything in the middle. You avoid the traffic Sibu. issues, etc. And and, um, and and I do think that there are thresholds. If you want a certain level of complexity in your economy, you're going to need enough diversities that you need about three million. Three million to four million. Now, once you pass eight million the, ch the major challenge is how you organize your city spatially, because otherwise it's a disaster, you know? And mostly cities have entered the zone of being a disaster, I must say. But I, I don't want, uh, there's much more to be said about your question. Well, one of the problems is people that they want to live in a city living outside the city. Those gated yeah. communities, 
of very rich ghettos or very poor ghettos. Those very rich that they want very high walls. The bigger the wall is, the more people will, ex will wait for you on the exit. So I think it's a very egotist way. I'm seeing that in Sao Paulo. I became, because there is no city life. There is no multifunctions. There is no multi-income. So the more, it's very simple. The more you mix urban functions, the more you mix incomes, the more you mix ages, the more you mix uh, religions, the more human the city became. So some cities of 100,000 people, they are so separated. Commuter-based uh, mobility, which at the end of the day, you have the same problems in a city from 500,000 people. So the question is the way how you organize a city life. And it, it is possible to make it in very big cities a good quality of life. So as long as you don't, don't organize like gated communities and other issue, building. Uh, if you have, I never accepted as a mayor a separation of incomes. If you look at my city, you try to look through an area of photography, you'll never recognize mm. housing programs because they are mixed. Mm -hmm. yep. But now, some governments, including the government of Brazil, they are doing houses like soldiers. In Mexico, it's the biggest company that built. I know. And there are, you know, there are people, they, have their, they don't want to move to the, those houses. Because it's far from work, far from public transport, far from everything. Why, why should they move? Better to live in a slum. The principles of Freiburg, can they be scaled up to a, a fast-growing Indian city, or no. they can't? That's the extreme. You're duly juxtaposed to extremes there. I mean. no, no, well, this, this question is not a good one. Because? Well, you know, we wrote down the Charter of Freiburg. You yeah. can go into the internet and can see it. There is are written down 12 principles in which way requirements of a city in future for planning development can go. You can take two or three of these points away and add some others. It's only the point that you start the discussion in your city in which way you can bring a sort of better life to the people. We did it, not writing it down and say, here we have it, like a Bible. No, we did it after we had done it. We, had, well, we, we managed it and then we wrote it down. Huh? Yeah. So, <laughs> this is the main, main important point, because normally a lot of people are writing something, and then you have a very good book, uh, no one reads it, but it's, uh, it's standing anywhere, and says, well, had you followed my ideas, then everything in the world would be fine. Huh? How many books are, uh, are manufactured in the university and no one reads them? Huh? So for my opinion, there is a very big uh, point which I always try to discuss. You must, must find out, uh, it's, a city is like a spider in the middle. A spider had a network, huh? network. How long can a spider go? And in which way are you able to integrate the people in it. I was asked when I finished my, my job, I was asked if I could help uh, Istanbul, city development of Istanbul. Germans and Turkish people have since history a long connection. So I was asked, and there were several times to Istanbul, they have around 16, 17 million people which are listed. There are around 4 million people which are not listed, huh? not listed. So I looked uh, for several times, I looked on it, and I said, well, I can do that job. But one thing is necessary. 
When you have the size of cities still 350, 450, 500,000 inhabitants, you can, you can just have very short, uh, very short distance to all people who live inside. You know everything, how to handle it. The farther it goes outside, the farther those who govern a city are too far away from the population. So I told them, you have to think about it. You have one parliament in the middle who makes, makes the main aspects, aspects, and the rest you should integrate several parliaments which have an own budget, has an own budget that you are closer to the, to the, to the population, and the population then has a closer contact to you. I never heard anything again. <laughs> okay. So, it is, Jamie, that is our work. So I can only say, it depends always on the persons. And the window must be open. And the window must be open. And to say, this is not working, is not existing. If these right persons are not sitting in the boat, mm -hmm. this must, be a, must not be a big group. Some brilliant people, if we had met before, huh? <laughs> to come together, then it works. If these people are not in the boat, you are lost. Okay. Um, well, Bristol's got a, quite an interesting person uh, steering the boat at the moment. So, yep. Um, yep. Uh, I mean, Jamie was talking about how he's been talking about this for, for decades and uh, nothing ever seems to happen. Maybe, maybe Bristol can, can prove him wrong. But thank you very much to our speakers and thank you, thank you all for coming.